here today in celebration of the resurrection of Jesus, who is the Christ. Now, please understand, Christ is not Jesus' last name. Some people think that his name is Jesus Christ, and Christ is his last name. No, that's not his last name. The word Christ actually means the Holy One, or the Anointed One, the Messiah of Israel. So you understand Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, but he's also the savior of the world. And so we're here today in celebration of the resurrection of Jesus, who is the Christ. But we're also here in celebration of our resurrection. See, for those of us who believe, Jesus actually said this in John's gospel. John chapter 11 In verses 25 and 26, Jesus said this. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And what that means is this. It means that if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, but you die a physical death, when Jesus returns, you will live again. He will raise you up. But at the same time, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ and Jesus returns before you die, you will never die. See, the resurrection of Jesus actually proves that there is life beyond this earthly life. Are you hearing me? The resurrection of Jesus proves that there is life beyond this earthly life. And so let's kind of look and examine the resurrection of Jesus in a couple of different ways. But let's begin with Jesus already dead. Let's begin reading right there in Matthew's gospel. Matthew chapter 27. And let's begin reading right there in verse 57. And it reads, When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut out in the rock. He rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, That is, the day after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said, while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Lease his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. And the last fraud would be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting the guard. After the Sabbath, toward toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the gods trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid for the know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. For he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he laid. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb and with fear and great joy and ran to tell the disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came up. 
and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. While they were going, behold, some of the guards went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a significant sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And the story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Stop right there. And that same story that the disciples of Jesus came and stole the body of Christ has been spread even to this day. Now, what we have here, what we're looking at here in this passage of scripture is actually a synopsis or a brief summary of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Notice again those words, a brief summary. And the reason why I give, this is a brief summary is because when you go through the other gospel accounts, you see, you hear, you know, you understand that there was more to the resurrection than what, what, what we just looked at right here. But Here's the thing I want you to see. Here's the thing I want you to understand, and that is this. It is important to read all of the gospel accounts because the more you read, the more you understand. And the more you understand, the more you appreciate. And the more you appreciate, the more you trust. And the more you trust, the more you see. And the more you see, the more your faith grows. See, because I understand something. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that's why I tell you constantly, it is so important that you get into the word of God. I cannot emphasize that enough. You have a lot of people, a lot of Christians who are still very, very young in the faith, even though they've been walking with the Lord five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, simply because they do not feast upon the word of God. You think about it. You can go to school for years and years and years and years. You could have a perfect attendance record. But if you never open up a book when you get there, guess what? You're never going to get an education. Listening to pastors is okay. Listening to TV ministers is okay. One of my favorite pastors is Dr. Tony Evans. I like to listen to Tony Evans. But guess who I like to listen to more? Jesus. Tony's good, but Jesus is better. Amen? Amen? And so when I open up the word of God, I'm getting it direct. I'm getting it direct from on high. And what really makes that special is the fact that he, the king of all of creation, took the time to take something, to open it up, and to present it to you. That makes it special. And so again, take the time to get into the word of God. Now, when we look closely at what we're looking at here today, there are four major points that I want you to see. The first point that I want you to see is this. Number one, that Jesus is dead. Please understand that Jesus is dead. And the reason why that's so important is because you cannot have a resurrection without having a death. Amen? Amen. In fact, the word resurrection actually means raising something from the dead. You cannot have a resurrection without there first being a death. And guess what? The power of the gospel is found in the resurrection of Christ. And that's why the enemy so many ways and so many times, again, attacks the resurrection. Over the years, one of the lies that's been passed down is that Jesus didn't die on the cross. He just fainted. See, he had been beaten, and he had been crucified, and he was just in excruciating pain. And because of the pain, then he just fainted. And when he fainted, they thought he was dead, and they took him off of the cross, and they put him in the tomb. 
And while he was in the tomb, the cool of the tomb revived him. Now, I don't know how much you know about the Romans, but the Romans perfected crucifixion. And they knew when somebody was dead. But then the people also who forgot to, uh, who, who, who tried to put that, um, that premise forth, also forgot to mention the fact that they took a spear and they stabbed him in the side. Out which came water and blood, which signifies a ruptured heart. Jesus actually died from a ruptured heart, a broken heart. And so Jesus did not faint. He did not swoon. He was dead. Another thing that's gone out over the years to try to discount the resurrection of Jesus was that it was a mistaken identity. That wasn't really Jesus on the cross. It was somebody who looked like Jesus. Tell that to his mother. Tell that to his mother who was sitting right there. Tell that to John, the disciple whom he really loved. The one who says, John, behold the woman, your mother. Mother, behold your son. These people were up close, personal with Jesus. But again, my point is that there cannot be a death with, I mean, there cannot be a resurrection without a death. Now, the second thing that I want you to see, when, before I can get to that, let me point out to you, in this that we looked at, we see three groups of people who are testifying to the death of Jesus. We have men, women, and angels. We have men, women, and angels testifying that Jesus has died. First, we have Joseph. Joseph of Arimathea. He was a rich man. See, do not think that all of the disciples of Jesus were fishermen. Jesus had hundreds of disciples, not just the twelve. And so he had this one guy named Joseph who was a rich guy. He was a disciple of Jesus. He testified that Jesus was dead. How did he testify he was dead? Because he went to Pilate and asked for the body. You don't go and ask for the body of a live person. He wouldn't ask for the body which testified that Jesus was dead. The second person you have testifying and this is, again, to show you the power of the gospel. You had Pilate. Pilate was the uh, governing authority. Pilate also testified that Jesus was dead. How? By giving the body of Jesus to Joseph. But then you also had the women who testified that Jesus was there. They saw him die on the cross. They saw him being taken off of the cross, and they followed them as they put him in the tomb. We also have the enemies of Jesus testifying that Jesus was dead. The Pharisees and the Sadducees who said, give us a guard detail so that we can make sure that his disciples doesn't come and steal the body. But then we also have the angel testifying to the fact that Jesus was dead. The angel who rolled back the stone, not to let Jesus out, but to let the women in so that they can see that he is not here. He has risen. Right? So, again, point number one, you have, again, people testify that Jesus is dead. And the reason why that is so important is because you cannot have a resurrection without a death. Now, the second thing I want you to see is this. Nobody, absolutely nobody expected to see Jesus alive again. And why? Because dead men don't walk. Now, there are times when you might be somewhere and the dead person might raise their arm or raise their leg or sit up, which would normally clear a room. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. You know, unless you are Jamaican and you're doing a, a funeral and you're doing walking of the dead, 
I don't know if you know about that, but the first time I heard that, I just thought that was the strangest thing. Where they take the dead person out of the coffin and they put him in a chair where they send him up against the wall and they put a cigarette in his hand, sunglasses on his face like. <laughs> but that person's propped. <laughs> so nobody, nobody expected Jesus to rise from the dead because dead men don't rise up. Now, there have been, over the years, incidents where a person might be dead for a few minutes and they were able to bring them back, right? There have actually been incidents over the years where you had a person who literally appeared to be dead because their heartbeat was so faint and they actually took them and put them in the morgue or whatever, but they were revived. You even have Lazarus, who was physically dead for four days. But never over the course of the history of man have you had anybody who was beaten, beaten to an inch of their lives. Now, don't. When you, when you hear about Jesus being whipped, don't just think of a whip, you know, like we think of a whip, it's one string. No, it's what's called a cat of nine tails. Nine tails, short little whip, long straps, and in each one of these straps, you had nine tails. And in these straps, you had bone, and you had glass, and you had metal. And literally sometimes they would actually beat a person to death. So they beat Jesus where his back is ripped. In fact, the Bible says they beat him so bad he didn't even look like a man. So they beat him. Then they crucified him. Then they stabbed him in the side. There has never been over the course of history. Anybody under them circumstances being brought back to life. And so again, nobody, not even the disciples of Jesus, expected to see him alive again. Now, the third thing that I want you to see and understand is this. And that is the meaning and the purpose behind the public proclamation of the resurrection. The purpose Behind. See, God always has a purpose for everything that he does or everything that he allows. He has a purpose, and his purpose is always good. It's always good. Now, that does not mean that everything that we go through, even as Christians, is going to be good, but God has a purpose in that. What the devil means for bad, God loves to use for good. So there is a purpose. There is a purpose in, again, the public proclamation of the resurrection of Christ. And here it is. It is to displace fear and to bring joy. It is to displace fear and bring joy. See, if there is one thing that keeps human beings in constant fear is death. Everybody is afraid to die. Nobody wants to die. Now, yes, there are circumstances where sometimes you have a person who is very, very ill. They're very, very sick. They might be in a, in a, in a situation where there's a lot of pain and they want to get out of that painful situation. But guess what? If they can be healed and out of that situation, they would choose that over death. Amen. Because nobody wants to die. Guess what? Nobody plans their death like they do a wedding. Nobody sits there and goes, okay, all right, well, this is what I want you guys to do. You know, I want my casket to look like this. And I want to have this color on the inside of the casket, and I want to have on my suit to match it. Right? I want my suit to match, and I'm going to have my tie, and I'm going to have my handkerchief, you know, and I want to be... Right? I want to be propped. I want to be set. Now, okay, now, and also, I want so and so come to sing this song and sing this song and sing this song and sing this song. And then I want Pastor, Pastor, I want you to come and preach this message and preach this message. Now, after the funeral, right, when y'all go to the repast, you know, y'all know I like to do electric slide. (laughs) 
So when y'all get to the repass, I want you to do the electric slide, you know, to some earth, wind, and fire. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No. Nobody plans their death like they do a wedding. Nobody, I can't wants to die. Which reminds me of the story of the little boy. He's in the Sunday school class, right? And the teacher tells the class and asks the class this question. She says, hey, how many of you, when you die, you want to go to heaven and be with Jesus? And everybody except for this one little boy raised his hand. And so after the class, the teacher says, hey, how come you didn't raise your hand? I asked the question of when you die someday, don't you want to go be with the Lord? The little boy says, oh, I didn't hear you say someday. I thought you were talking about today. (laughs) Nobody wants to die. Amen? Nobody wants to die. Nobody looks forward to death with joy. And that's because there's a certain amount of fear that's attached to death. And the fear that is attached to death is judgment. And that judgment goes all the way back to the garden with Adam and Eve. When God told Adam and Eve, look, you can eat from all of these trees. You can eat from any tree in the garden that you want to eat from, but do not eat from the tree that's in the middle of the garden. So the day you eat from this tree, you shall surely die. And guess what? Man ate from the tree and man died. Instantly man died. He died a spiritual death, but that also started the process to the physical death. And so therefore, ever since then, there has been a fear attached to death. But, and this is good news. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Again, death has lost its sting. Listen to what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 55 through 57, it says, Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. See, understand something. When we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, when we humble ourselves before him, asking him to come into our hearts, to come into our lives, Right? And to be our Lord and our Savior. When we do that, then the Bible says we are born again. Born again. Born again meaning that we're born again from above. Born again of God's Spirit. And when we're born again of God's Spirit, the Bible says we become a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things pass away. Behold, all things are new. See, what happens is this. When you are born again from above, you actually have the same spirit that was in Christ that raised him from the dead also abides in you. You have the spirit of God in you. And because you have the spirit of God in you, all of a sudden you have the desire to live godly. That doesn't mean that you walk out the door, you automatically start living perfectly, but you desire Old things pass away. Behold, all things are new. Old things pass away is I used to do this. I used to do that. And man, I still want to do that. But I really don't want to do that. There's a new desire. There's a new appetite. You hunger and you thirst after righteousness. Behold, old things pass away. All things become new. So I don't know about you, but that's how I knew that I was saved. My appetite changed. I walked in the church on a Wednesday night. No, actually it was a Tuesday night. Tuesday night one way, got filled with the Spirit, and my appetite changed. All of a sudden I desired to read the Word of God. It was just, it was like food for my soul. Oh my God, 
I wanted to go to church. Whereas before going to church was like, oh my God, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I ain't going. But all of a sudden now it's like, I want to go to church. I want to be around the people of God. One of the greatest things in my young Christian days was a shut-in. So some of y'all know what a shut-in is. Some of you don't. A shut-in is when you, you went in the church maybe on a Friday night and you stayed all Friday night, all day Sunday. I mean, all day Saturday, right? And you left Sunday morning, you went home, you got dressed, and you came back to church. And what'd you do all weekend? You fast, and you prayed, and you reached out to God, and you worshiped God. That was a highlight. That was a great thing. The people at my job at the time said, so what are you doing this weekend, Daryl? I'm going to shut in. You're a strange little man. <laughs> You're a strange little man. Yeah, appetites change. Old things pass away. Behold, all things are new. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Picture it this way. Picture a caterpillar. We've all seen caterpillars. Little ugly little creature going along the ground. You just look at it. You know, and claw, you know, crawls it on the ground and goes up in the tree, then it goes up in the tree, and it makes a cocoon, and it goes in that cocoon. Then that cocoon, that caterpillar, is metamorphosized. It's born again. It comes out of the cocoon, a new creation. Amen? It's a new creation. Now here's something about a butterfly. Every now and then, you'll see that butterfly walking on the ground like it did when it was a caterpillar. But because it has a new creation, it can't stay on the ground anymore. It has to fly. So when you receive again Jesus Christ into your heart, into your life as your personal Lord and Savior, you become a new creation in Christ. And when you become a new creation in Christ, your bodily appetites, they just begin to change. So, when we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, first there is a spiritual resurrection. But then if we die before he returns for us, then there is a physical resurrection. But either way it goes. When the Lord returns, he's going to raise us up. Now, we're almost done. Out of all of the things that the Bible teaches, one of the most important things is, is the resurrection of Christ. The resurrection of Christ. And here's why. Listen to what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 17, it says, if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Did you hear that? Listen to that closely. If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. See, the resurrection of Christ is proof positive that he is the way, the truth, and the life. It's proof positive that he is the only way to the Father. So that's one of the ways, again, you can, you know, you can shift through all of the different voices of the world. You can shift through all of this religion or this religion or this philosophy and that philosophy. The resurrection of Christ says that behold, Behold the true and the living God. Because when you look at Buddha, Buddha is buried over here. You look at Muhammad, Muhammad is buried over there. You look at Confucius, Confucius is buried over here. You look at all of the founders of all of the philosophies of the world, all the world religious leaders and founders, all of them are dead. But you look for Jesus, he's not here. He is risen. Now, it says here that, and again, to show you how man works many times 
in conjunction with God, but not even know that he's working in conjunction with God. Did you notice how it says that, that the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the haters of Jesus went to Pilate and said, Pilate, give us a guard detail so that we can make sure that the body stays in the tomb. Otherwise, his disciples will come and steal the body and say that he rose from the dead. Right? What that did was that put a lock on the fact that Jesus' body could not be stolen. It's because that guard detail, first of all, you got a Roman uh, uh, guard. It's not a Jewish thing. These are Roman guards. These guards are bad to the bone. Anybody that walk past, they flex on them, boy. <laughs> Don't make me. I ain't killed nobody all day. <laughs> Say hello to my little friend. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. <laughs> Renew your minds. <laughs> if you knew how much I was holding back, you would commend me. But here these guys are, right? They, they, they're ready to kill somebody. And with the seal being on there, the seal said that anybody who moved this thing or touched this thing will be put to death. Do you also know that the reason why they gave the guards the money and say, if, you, if this gets back to the governor, we will get you out of trouble was because if they fell asleep on guard duty, they could be put to death. We're going to end with this. Do you know all they had to do to do away with Jesus and Christianity was to produce the body? That's all they had to do was produce the body. But they could not produce the body because he has risen. Jesus' resurrection is the foundation of the Christian faith. It is the bedrock and the foundation of the Christian faith. If you do away with the resurrection of Jesus, you know what you have? You have another human teacher and another fallen creature. That's it. He would be just like the rest. But the fact that he rose from the dead is proof positive that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus, after rising from the dead, appeared again and again and again over the next 40 days, showing people, telling people, touch me, handle me, see that I am not a ghost, for I have flesh and bone. People lie to save their lives. Amen? Nobody lies to be put to death. But all of the disciples of Jesus except for John, was those the original 11, all of them died a violent death because they had seen the risen Lord. And here's the thing. Jesus still rises up today. See, I'm one of those people that he rose up in me. As I said before, I would have never, ever, ever imagined being a pastor. I would have never imagined standing up here telling people about Jesus. That was not my forte. That was not my plan. But this was God's plan. And here's the thing. He's not a respecter of persons. He's willing to accept anybody who is willing to humble themselves before him. See, the gospel message, a gospel message is good news for the humble, but it's bad news for the proud. It's bad news for the proud because they can't save themselves. They can't do anything. They can't even bring anything to the table that could add to the salvation. It's not Jesus plus this. It's just Jesus. So the good news on this Easter Sunday is that the Lord wants to arise in you today. There's hope for you in Christ. Let's pray. Mm-hmm.